but who is just coming from Donetsk and Mariupol, a famous reporter, Hi. Simon Ostrovsky. <laughs> Simon Ostrovsky, very happy to have you here. How are you guys? Yeah, we're doing all right. It's a lively Sunday night. <laughs> some events, we get some interesting people in the studio, so that's very good. How yeah. are you doing? How have your most recent trips been? Uh, it's been interesting. I've just spent uh, about a week and a half in Mariupol and in Donetsk, and we uh, produced a bunch of uh, dispatches for Vice News, which you can check out on vicenews.com. We, we did two dispatches on Mariupol, um, the city which uh, many people think might be the next target of a potential um, uh, attack, and uh, and we were in Donetsk at the airport where they're using prisoners of war um, to uh, look for the bodies of uh, fallen Ukrainian soldiers there, um, which which for me was a very powerful story that we did because um, you know it's incredible to be standing next to these people who are essentially slaves and. You're right there with them, and your situation is so far beyond what their situation is. It's hard to imagine another type of place where you could be standing next to a person who's, you know, at a lower social position than you, that, that much lower of a social position than you. Um, it's uh, pretty strong. How is the general situation in Donetsk, uh, which is under the uh, separatist uh, control? Uh, because this, people speak about the ceasefire, we definitely understand there is no such uh, escalation, but uh, what's happening now? It's pretty quiet in Donetsk, actually. I mean, um, there are obviously incidents uh, along the front line, but um, you know, you, you hear artillery fire off in the distance, but it's nothing like it used to be mm. um, when you could actually feel the blast waves um, just when you were in the center of the city. So I think you know, the ceasefire, uh, although it's not 100 percent, it's uh, really holding up until now. And I mean, how does the mood there compare with Mariupol? Because there's still been active fighting near there, right? Well, I think in, in Mariupol it's really much the same as it in, is in Donetsk. There's a, um, a few shootouts every once in a while, but there's no sort of, it's not a war, it's more of tit for tat, mm -hmm. um, harassing fire every now and again. Um, I don't think anybody at the moment feels like there's going to be an imminent invasion of either Mariupol or the other way around in Donetsk. Now, and what, what's the role of Azov Battalion there? Because you had been out with them and their people in the field, and you pointed out that they're one of the few battalions, or you know, including the Ukrainian army, that's actually taken new territory. I mean, what, what is their outlook? Are they being more active, or is it the same tit-for-tat situation? Well, during the uh, fighting for Debaltseva, um, when the Ukrainian troops were surrounded, actually Debaltseva and the areas around it were taken over, uh, by pro-Russia forces, um, which led to really a lot of Ukrainians, uh, military personnel dying and a lot of uh, equipment being left behind. Um, the Azov Battalion, which is this far-right um, uh, battalion, some of uh, whose members express sort of Nazi ideology um, and, and, and symbolism, like, you know, some of them have sort of SS things written on their mm -hmm. helmets and... Or tattooed on the back of their heads. Or tattooed seen, on the back yeah. of their heads. No, there was one guy in our dispatch who had some uh, Norse runes tattooed on his head, which I think is something that far-right people enjoy doing for some reason. Um, anyhow, when, when Debaltseva was going on, their response um, to try to take pressure off of uh, the fighting in the north was to launch a counterattack in the south mm -hmm. because they wanted to draw um, some of the pro-Russia forces away from Debaltseva down towards their area and they actually managed to take, I don't know, 10, 20 kilometers of uh, territory outside of Mariupol and thereby move the front line 20 kilometers closer to the Russian border away from, uh, away from the city. At least that's how they tell it. I wasn't there at the time, so I don't know whether it was just uh, the Azov Battalion um, which took this decision to take the pressure off of Debaltseva or whether um, there were other parts of the Ukrainian military which were also uh, involved, but they mm. certainly like to take responsibility for yeah, it. Yeah, but that's what you often uh, hear from them. Uh, and what is your access? I'm very curious, how easy is it to get into the Ukrainian army position? And it's very interesting in this conflict that you can be both in the both sides, in the DNR control area, in, with the Ukrainian military, with the battalions. Um, how is it for you? 
Well, with uh, the Ukrainians, there's a few layers of bureaucracy that you have to get through before you want to film anything. Um, if you want to go to film something as simple as a checkpoint, uh, you can't just sh roll up and then turn your cameras on because that'll get you in trouble with the soldiers there and they have guns and you don't want to get in trouble with people who have guns. Um, so they end up phoning their commanders and their commanders invariably say, no, don't let them film. And so mm -hmm. then you have to go through other official channels and often it takes a lot of time. And, uh, you know, I'd say 70% of our work as journalists isn't actually going and filming something, but it's arranging to get permission to film something. So that's all of the behind, boring behind the scenes that goes on is like being on the phone endlessly with people trying to get them to agree to let you go somewhere, go through a checkpoint, film a checkpoint, film something else, get the right work. You know, these days if you want to be able to film on both sides of the um, front line, you need uh, two pieces of paper from the Ukrainian government, that's the ATO press card from the defense ministry, as well as a pass, and the pass will only allow you to go through one checkpoint. So if you want to go through any of the other checkpoints, you need to get passes for those checkpoints as well. That's, that's interesting, because we kind of don't have these troubles, maybe it's something for, but it maybe depends. No, you get a Sector B yep. pass that allows you to go through okay. Kurakhova. Um, but if you want to go through like the more you, uh, the um, northern checkpoints, you need a pass for Sector C or M. I don't remember what all of the passes are called. That's just the Ukrainian side. If you uh, want to film on the uh, separatist side, then you need a so-called civilian press card issued by the uh, separatist government there, and uh, you also need a military uh, press card issued by the, um, the sort of intelligence services uh, of the self-declared republics. And that's not including Lugansk region, I'm just talking about the Donetsk areas controlled by the separatists. For Lugansk, it's a whole other set of paperwork that's that you true. need. So. Good, it is uh, still a paperwork. There is a question from you, from uh, the people watching us, from Aisha, ask there is a focus on the areas where conflict continues. Are conditions imp improved in surrounding areas? What have you, have you mentioned that? No, conditions are getting worse because um, there's a blockade, which I think has been going on since December for food products and all kinds of products. And the Ukrainian checkpoints uh, are being very strict with people who want to bring anything into the region. It's part of uh, Ukraine's policy, which I think probably your viewers know about to economically uh, starve the separatist regions. And that's hitting the ordinary um, residents of the region very hard. It's not a measure that only affects those who have taken up arms, obviously. And I think it's geared towards uh, creating social unrest and dissatisfaction with the separatist authorities. Um, I don't know how effective it's been so far, but what it has been effective in doing is making it very difficult for people to get food. So what's the yeah. mood on the ground now? I mean, compared to a few months ago or the last time you were there, there's a ceasefire, so in Donetsk it's quieter, but are the people more frustrated or struggling more? I don't know if people are more frustrated. The situation has been really tough for a very long time, and I think pretty much anybody you speak to expresses their anger at the Ukrainian government, um, who's stuck behind the front lines, because life is very difficult there, and they end up uh, blaming the um, Ukraine for a lot of it, because uh, it is the Ukrainians who aren't allowing the food to come through. And especially recently, there's been a, there's been a problem um, at the checkpoints with just regular people wanting to get in and out uh, there's been reports of bribes being taken um, on the, on the yeah, Ukrainian side. That's what we're extensively side. covering for the last uh, month or so. There is a huge debate here as well with the different <coughs> organizations trying to sue the government and to sue the, you know, the um, security service for all that. But that's a lot of paperwork We have one, well. other, one other tweet okay. if you want to pull it up. Yep. We had it here. Um, so we have from MPOPs, am I looking at it right, yep. from behind me? Uh, so they're just asking you, you know, so you were there from the, in the beginning, can you summarize Ukraine's year from your perspective and the way forward? I mean, do you see the conflict differently? How? Well, it's hard to summarize a year. Um, but yeah. I think uh, what Ukraine hasn't done um, <clears throat> is sort of taken away the fuel for the nationalist, the Russian nationalist fervor in Eastern Ukraine, I think. Ukraine mm -hmm. um, obviously hasn't, done a lot of the things that it's been accused of uh, right. by Russian propaganda. Uh, there, there was never a genocide of uh, the Russian-speaking population in Ukraine. That was exaggerated, but I think a lot of Ukrainians mean that 
take that to mean that they didn't have any fault in what happened. Mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, that they should take the humanist initiative and instead of uh, leaving issues like, you know, the Russian language and uh, decentralization uh, as cards that uh, Russian nationalists in eastern Ukraine can play against them, they should give those rights to people all across Ukraine mm -hmm. um, so that uh, the, the nationalists wouldn't be able to throw that, you know, in the face of uh, uh, Ukrainians. Why shouldn't the yeah. Russian language uh, be an official language in a country where nearly half the population speaks it as their first tongue? Uh, why shouldn't um, regions uh, have more control over their own destiny? Not just, there shouldn't be a special status, in my view, for eastern Ukraine and the areas controlled by the separatists. I think every region should have a special status, and that would take um, the fuel away from the uh, nas Russian nationalists in eastern well, Ukraine. I mean, in two points on that, there are some Ukrainians who support, you know, some more rights for the regions because they see it being as a corrupt, overly centralized system, and that if things were closer, there'd be more potential to try and fix it. But coming back to your other point, because we've been talking a lot about propaganda tonight, and you talked about giving you know, fuel to Russian nationalists, to separatists, to others, you know, anything that you have that seems to be cracking down on Russians or less tolerant or vaguely oriented towards right parties creates fuel for that. But if I'm going to play devil's advocate, which I will for a moment, it seems like even when that's not true, it gets made up. I mean, you can make these actions, but there's so much spin and there's so many things that are made up. And, you know, when I've spoken to people and I've been in the East not for a while, you know, what people kind of relay, the stories they have and what they believe is often not really based on the truth. It's stories they've heard from relatives or from people who have their own strong biases. So how, how do you balance that? I mean, I agree with you, but I... I I'm not sure what your question is. You're making the argument, you know, they should give more rights to regions or they should give more status to the Russian language to take fuel away from these fires, this criticism for Ukraine. But yeah. that criticism will always be there. Does the reality matter when propaganda is so strong? Well, I think that's a cop-out to say that it doesn't matter what we do um, because they're just going to lie about what we do anyways. You've still got to, uh, you know, provide justice and fairness for your citizens, no matter what outsiders say about what you're doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't take actions in order to affect the way outsiders see you. You've got to take actions in order to try to improve the lives of the people who live in your country. But I mean, in Ukraine, so much depends on the way people in other countries see it. You know, their financing, their support, Russia's actions. It seems like that's almost a luxury they don't have. They're constantly worried about people think. Now, they're not always the best at shaping that image, but that's a much more major concern in Ukraine than it is in many other countries. Well, I don't think Ukraine has a huge problem with getting its point across to the country that see themselves allied with Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And that's where Ukraine is getting its support from. And I don't think that's going to change, to be honest. Um, you know, Ukraine's problem is really with Russia. Uh, and it's, it's up to Russia to change, I think, in order for their uh, behavior towards Ukraine to change. I don't think Ukraine can change Russia's behavior in any way. But what Ukraine can do is change the situation on the ground for its own citizens. And I don't think you need to think about how Russia sees that. Um, you, you just do need to take away the fuel well, for the extremists use inside Ukraine. But I mean, I think that's a separate, you know, there's the, fuel there's the fuel question, but I think what you're touching on is Ukraine needs to try and build the best society it can for itself, for the people who live here and for the future that it has, as difficult as that is. Um, and I mean, I think that's a perfectly fair point to make and there. For me, that would be um, the, the last, for me, while you're working uh, on the ground, especially on the separatist control areas, mm -hmm. you know, there was a lot of talk that these guys get out of the Russian control, that they are kind of the world lords. How is there? What is it? We understand it's very hard for the journalists to really film the Russian military because they definitely don't want to be filmed. Yeah. Uh, but in general, can you explain more how it's working, how they are coordinated? How the uh, locals... How, how, how independent the local, they are. How independent the, they are? the local politics is from Russia? Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't have an inside view into how all of that works. I don't walk around with Zaharchenko all day and listen to who he's talking to on the phone. So I can only try to, you know, make inferences about what's going on. Um, but, uh, you know, there's definitely a core of people who are local in uh, both Donetsk and Lugansk region who um, are against Ukrainian statehood. Um, and uh, there's very obviously Russian uh, influence and Russian arms and Russian fighters in Ukraine that's been established time and time um, again. Uh, you know, 
uh, journalists who I trust have seen with their own eyes uh, columns of Russian armor uh, going across um, the Russian-Ukrainian border into Ukraine. You know, we saw those 10 um, airborne troops who were captured in Ukraine and paraded on Ukrainian TV. Um, today, I think, is the premiere of the uh, film that Putin gave an interview in mm -hmm. uh, about uh, Crimea, where apparently, I haven't seen it yet, but he admits um, that he ordered the annexation of Crimea before the referendum. So I I that's all in the trailer already. You don't even have to right, watch okay. the film to get there. So, yeah. I mean, you know, probably six months from now or a year from now, um, uh, Russia's involvement uh, will become, you know, Russia's involvement will become clear and, and, and ad admitted by the Russian side in eastern Ukraine as well. And uh, just very, sh very brief, uh, while there is a lot of uh, anxiety, so what would happen there? It's not up to you to decide and to see in the east, in the front line. Yeah. So was it, it, does it look as it's getting calmer or is it uh, there are any sign that the fight will, another big fight will start? Right now it doesn't feel like there's going to be another um, big push uh, from either side. I think um, both sides are interested in um, you know, leaving things on an even keel right now. I think, you know, the Ukrainians um, took some really punishing losses over the last couple of months. Uh, and uh, the Russians achieved, or the pro-Russia forces achieved all of their tactical goals, if not their strategic goals, you know. They evened out the front line. Um, they got rid of that uh, annoying pocket, which made it very difficult for them to travel from Donetsk to Lugansk and Debaltseva. Um, they took over the airport and pushed away the line from the uh, from their capital city um, so like right now I don't see what else they would want to achieve why waste so much energy when they could just solidify what they already have they're trying to do what they're calling state building at okay. least that's what it looks like okay thanks a lot Simon we really great to happy to have you uh, here and definitely all your fans would watch uh, your uh, dispatches. It's already more than 100, 101 the, of the Russian roulette. Yeah, 101. Uh, you can go on uh, YouTube and just type in Russian roulette dispatch 101 and then watch them backwards. <laughs> or go to vicenews.com. You can go to the beginning. And go to and we will find our